Hello and welcome to a video. Today I am showing you my very first no water mead. Let's get started. So this mead right here is a no water peach mead. I've never done a no water brew, um, mostly because they're extra challenging in that you can't um, add any water. This is a no water peach mead that came from all peaches. Here's where the challenge begins. It's a lot of fruit. <laughs> I had um, two really good friends who are from Colorado um, mention that they were gonna go back home for a little bit and they wanted to pick up some peaches and they said, hey, we know you homebrew. Do you need fruit? <laughs> and I said, of course. So they got some really nice uh, Palisade peaches. So shout out to Trent and Jenna, um, if you guys are watching. Um, they got me about, it turned out to be 12 to 14 pounds of peaches. I used part of those peaches for a different brew, and then I had six pounds left that were frozen. I decided, let's go ahead and attempt a no water brew. I knew that my brew was going to be uh, smaller because six pounds of peaches only yielded after pressing and doing all the right things, about a uh, little over half a gallon of juice. So here's my recipe up on the screen. And uh, this is my first time doing this, so I'm not gonna sit here and, and say I've done it perfectly or anything. This is just explaining my experience. Uh, like six pounds of peaches that were juiced, I'll talk about that in a second. Two pounds of orange blossom honey. The Lauven BM 4x4 which is notably great for darker fruits, but also really promotes some big body in fruits. And uh, that was it to, to start. So now, oh, my, my lights are flashing. <laughs> so what I did was I, I, I bought this really kind of cheap juice press, uh, fruit press off of Amazon, and I was thinking it was gonna work well it, it didn't work all that well. I took my, my frozen fruit, I thawed it out, I put it into this honestly pretty crappy juicer and juiced as much as I possibly could with it. And then put that into a container, of course, mixed in my honey and my yeast. I almost said water, because I'm used to saying water. And then I, of course, added some yeast nutrient. I used for a made O, because let's feed our yeast as they need and uh, let that start fermenting. That starting gravity, um, I gotta go back to my notes, that starting gravity was about 1.084. Uh, it fermented decently quick, two to three weeks. Post that fermentation stage, I think our gravity was 1.000. It was flatlined, which is normal, expected. Um, I, it was yeasty, of course, because it was young. It just needed some time. So I racked it off and I put it into a new container. Uh, notably, I tried to fill up the container as best I could because I didn't want a lot of headspace on this thing. I let it sit for a little while. It just kind of mellowed for a couple weeks. I then said, all right, well, I want to back sweeten it. So I stabilized it. I used potassium sorbate, potassium metabisulfite, to halt yeast fermentation. I added um, more honey on top of this thing. I added eight ounces of orange blossom honey. Oh, I, I got my gravities wrong. I'm sorry, here are the correct gravities. Uh, 1.084, 1.010 after primary. After stabilizing and back sweetening, we were at 1.040. That point I was like, hey, sweet, it tastes good. Um, but it needs a little more tannin, a little more value in that regard. So I added some French oak. I added about, uh, let's see, one half ounce of French oak for a short amount of time. And it was only about five or six days. It's a lot of oak, a little time. Let that set. Of course, that did its thing. It added some oak flavor, but also some more tannin. This already had a nice amount of acidity to sweetness. I needed the tannin. And then from there, I moved off of the oak and I went ahead and bottled it. So 
At the point of bottling, it's, it was not clear. Here is an example. This brew is not clear, really at all. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that because I don't know if that having more clarity or less clarity will help. The bottle, <laughs> the bottle, the brew looks like this. And um, I decided, well, to test this theory to see if um, clearing the mead would affect it, I took one singular bottle, and I gotta move this super slowly, because I've just, I don't wanna disturb. The bottom of this bottle, if I can turn it, it's hard to turn right now, is all sediment. There it is, you can kinda see the back behind there. Is all sediment, because I used Kisasol Chitto Sand in this bottle only. So that's clear. This right here is a little sample of the not clear version. We're going to side by side them right now. And I'm gonna tell you how this thing tastes. Uh, it is set in roughly, I would say at about a 10% ABV brew. Let's open them up and pour really carefully. Oh, dang, I tried to, I've, so I poured as much as I could off of this before I got the uh, <laughs> sediment. Okay, so. You can see, I actually dumped a little bit into this one. My left hand is the um, more clear version, the cleared with Chittosan Kisasol. This one is not cleared. Um, let's go ahead and start with the not cleared one and just tell you what it tastes like. Ooh, the nose on it is fantastic. Bright, um, acidity, malic acid, plus, ooh, the, the oak is, super rich. It is inviting and nice. And this peach is a very, uh, obviously sweet smelling, but it's got such a warm note to it. It's a very warm smelling brew. Here we go. Oh man. Part of me is mad that this is so good only because it's a bit of a pain to make, especially if I wanted to make a five gallon batch of this, Oh my gosh, I can't even think about how many peaches that would be. This thing's fantastic though. Big body, huge, huge peach. Um, it's a, a peach bomb, I mean, it's really what it is. Fighting a light up here. I will say that the, um, the ABV is still apparent, still got some heat to it, that's okay. But that will mellow out over time. Gosh, it's just so good. It's just fruit, fruit juicy, honey, warmth, sweetness with a nice big uh, hug from a tree of oak just coming in. I can only imagine that given this, giving this more time will just <laughs> make it unstoppably amazing. And, but I, I only have a couple bottles of it. I am very, very low on my bottles. I have a couple of these small ones and then I have a few of them that are like 375s. So good. Now, some of you are asking, and the reason I did this, I wanna know, does clearing this brew affect the, the big body notes that we get from there? So, let me get one more last taste. Flipping over. Here is the clear version. Let's see if we've lost anything by clearing this. Mm, Nose-wise, I get a little more, a little more fruity note, less oak more uh, more pear and honey interesting there's uh, it's it's a smidge difference though i mean this still has both of them still have oak but this one has a little more peach and honey hmm it's still big body it's got the oak it's got the um the sweetness from the peach and then that peach juice flavor just coming in and swinging yeah, I mean, it's still the same viscosity. I would not say that, uh, the, the theory here is that when you uh, clear something and you're pulling all of the things from the bottom, sometimes you're pulling the tannin out. And uh, so that's what my first thought was. Okay, am I gonna lose the oak? I still get a, a nice oaky, honey forward, peach forward brew that presents really well. And I, I don't really, see any difference between these. And that's a bit of a bummer for me. <coughs> Not that I say I, I wanted to see a big difference, but I do know 
that my other bottles of this, like this one right here, it's not clear. And I'm not going to unbottle them and clear them. I am gonna let them just age like this. Unclear, and that's, that's totally fine. It does mean that if I do this in the future, this, this little test that I've done, this test makes me wonder, or makes me plan, to actually fully clear a no water brew. I, don't, I do not believe that anything was affected by pulling, pulling, by clearing it up. And uh, that's an important note to say because you want to present the best brew possible. Now, clarity is not the end of the world. I know some people are, are going to fight me on that and that's fine. And the truth is, if I was presented with both of these glasses, the one I'm gonna drink I'm going to be more excited to drink is going to be the more clear one because it looks more professional and I just think it's it's a nice presentation thing but it's not the end of the world if your brew is not clear that does not make it not good it's just presentation wise not as appealing so run forward with that notion idea and go make this brew, go make a no water brew. This is my first dive into it. And again, I'm not gonna sit here and say I've done it perfectly. If I did it, anything again, which I am gonna do this again, I will get a nice, a nicer juice, juicer of sorts and um, probably go bigger. This brew, it was expensive for a half gallon, but it is dang good. And I plan on making more and I know these bottles are gonna age really well. I hope you've enjoyed this. Let me know, have you made a no water brew down below? Um, I'm very curious and I will uh, hopefully see you in the future with another video. Hey look, a little bonus video. Um, my posting schedule is super crazy. I actually am four months out from when I finished that video you just watched. So first of all, look at the clarity picture on screen. Four months later, I'm gonna do a quick confirmation on whether or not it's the same as it was in that video. Yeah, so not clear, that's fine. Ooh, still peach bomb, nice sweet honey. I don't get any alcohol heat. I think I might have a few bottles left. This meat is great. Clarity again, it's not the end of the world. It'd be wonderful if this thing was crystal clear but it's not. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Cheers.